Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, another day, another 70 million phone calls monitored by the NSA. Were they listening in on the German Chancellor as well? Our web video of the week offers a prophetic look from 2004 at the surveillance state and its impact on fast food. The total is $67. $67? Drawing the line on digital enhancement. At what point does photoshopping a news picture change the essence of the image? And it's back to school time for Chinese journalists. Those helpful officials in Beijing are teaching them how to report on the government. You might be getting the impression that here at the Listening Post, we just can't get enough of the Edward Snowden story on government surveillance, secrecy, and national security. Last week, we looked at the impact the story is having on media in the UK, but now it's gone global. This past Monday, the French newspaper Le Monde reported the NSA had recorded more than 70 million phone calls in the country, including those of some high-profile politicians. Then the German news weekly, Der Spiegel, reported that German intelligence, prompted by research from the magazine, concluded that Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, may herself have been a target of American eavesdropping. Der Spiegel had also reported that the U.S. spied on Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto and his predecessor. Then there's the Brazilian angle and the chill this story has brought to President Dilma Rousseff's relationship with Washington. Our starting point, however, this week is Berlin and the slow drip feeding of a major news story. Der US-Geheimdienst NSA kann sich nach einem Medien... ...nouvelle Dimension à l'affaire de l'espionnage américain en Europe. It's been a drip, drip, drip effect that over the months must feel to the Obama White House like a slow, journalistic form of Chinese water torture. Between them, the source, Edward Snowden, and Glenn Greenwald, who works primarily for, but not exclusively with, The Guardian in the UK, have drip-fed news outlets in multiple countries, leaving diplomatic chaos and outraged politicians in their wake. We had this initial scoop that came with The Guardian and The Washington Post, but really it's kind of been franchised out to different publications all over the world, depending on where that story is going to have impact. So Glenn Greenwald has been writing for Le Monde in France. Rather than sort of be anchored to one organization, he and some of his colleagues have really placed these stories, it seems, where they're most likely to get the most readers in that country and sort of get the most play. The way that Greenwald himself explained this in Rio to us was that um, one of the major benefits was that it kept the NSA off kilter. The NSA doesn't actually know what Greenwald and his partners have in their possession because they they're releasing it bit by bit and in fact they've caught the NSA in a few outright lies. It's extremely difficult for the NSA to do any kind of damage control on these stories. The best thing that they can do at this point is try to ascertain specifically what documents Edward Snowden stole. I don't think they know exactly everything. And I think that the best thing that the NSA can do from a public relations standpoint at this point is they have to sort of just sit back and wait for it and anticipate it. Which is not easy because the Snowden Greenwald franchise keeps moving. Over the past week, it showed up in Germany, where Der Spiegel had previously reported on the NSA's industrial-scale surveillance of private communications there. When the story first broke in June, Chancellor Merkel made all the appropriate noises about a breach of trust between so-called allies. But when a subsequent German government investigation went further than Der Spiegel did, concluding that Merkel's own phone may have been tapped, she seemed to take it personally and got on the phone to Washington. Today, President Obama and Chancellor Merkel spoke by telephone. The president assured the chancellor that the United States is not monitoring and will not monitor the communications of the chancellor. But the White House did not say the U.S. hasn't bugged Merkel's BlackBerry in the past. That led the German paper Die Zeit to editorialize on Washington's half-hearted denials. It said it is time for Obama and the U.S. Congress to be ruthlessly transparent about the macabre practices of the NSA and restrain them strongly. And, as a columnist at Süddeutsche Zeitung put it, one doesn't dare imagine how Obama's secret services deal with enemy states when we see how they treat their closest allies. Prior to setting up shop with Der Spiegel in Germany, the Snowden Greenwald franchise swung through France, where it collaborated with Le Monde on the NSA and reported tens of millions of intercepted French phone calls, including those made by political leaders. 
It's simple. What Greenwald has brought to The Guardian and other papers around the world is a guide on how to practice this kind of electronic journalism and how to mine electronic databases. It's not that we didn't know that surveillance was going on. What is surprising is the extent of it. When you have it there in front of you, you really get the idea of just how far the U.S. has gone. It didn't surprise me that the NSA was monitoring communications in France. What was striking, though, into sources that I talked to as well, was the scale and the scope of it. I think governments understand that intelligence agencies spy on each other. Even our allies, we do this. We, know we monitor each other's communications. But the vastness of it seems to have taken people by surprise. I don't think it was a great shock to the French government because the French intelligence service is well aware that this goes on. There is a trade-off of intelligence, so it suited French intelligence, but it was never a, an issue that was but the French people. Is this a trade-off that we want to make? Germany's Der Spiegel also broke news on NSA surveillance in Mexico, which reportedly included spying on President Peña Nieto and his predecessor, Felipe Calderón. Compared to other leaders, Peña Nieto's reaction, which came on CNN Español, sounded downright diplomatic. Yo creo que sobre el tema de, de, de espionaje y sobre estos temas ha habido distintos señalamientos, lo que claramente el gobierno de México ante tales eh, especulaciones o este tipo de filtraciones simplemente ha dejado en claro que debe haber una investigación. Compare that to Brazil which learned the NSA has spied on its embassies, its state-owned oil company, and the president's office itself. President Rousseff postponed a state visit to Washington over the affair and has so little faith the Americans will change their ways that she is proposing Brazil builds its own internet infrastructure for reasons of, and here's the irony, national security. Glenn Greenwald is American, but happens to live in Rio de Janeiro. So when it came to finding a media partner there, he already knew the lay of the land. Greenwood has chosen to establish a contact with the largest media group in Brazil, that's global. They have a Sunday program and the information uh, has always been publicized through that program, which made possible for global and for Greenwood to make sure the largest audience possible will have contact with all those informations. After Brazil, France, Mexico, and Germany, where does this digitally drip-fed story drop into next? Given that The Guardian is now reporting the NSA has tapped the phones of 35 world leaders, that's anybody's guess. Delegations the U.S. is spying on its European allies is snowballing. It's been a huge global story in that it affects so many countries in the world the breadth of the collection of data. This taps right into the fiber optic cables that span the globe. So it doesn't matter whether the cables between US and Britain are being tapped, it's the world's conversations that are going through there. One of the most interesting things that Greenwald had to tell us in Rio was that in his mind the story had only just begun. He said he was sitting on thousands and thousands of documents. He was in uh, daily contact with Edward Snowden trying to figure out what was next and um, he mentioned Spain as being one of the next targets, India, and we haven't even really begun to touch Asia. So in his mind this is a story that he thinks will go on for quite a while. Our Global Village Voice is now on the widening coverage of the surveillance story. The way the revelations have been uh, controlled and managed and filtered by a small group of media custodians has diluted their impact and their effectiveness. Instead of a, a, a flood of stories from all directions, We've seen instead the slow, spaced out drip feed, which has given the power structure time to uh, get back on its feet, to manipulate the story more to its own advantage. The newspaper Le Monde has played a key role in unveiling the extent of NSA spying in France. Earlier this week, Le Monde ran an editorial insisting that its decision to disclose information was responsible and did not endanger the security of the US or its allies. The newspaper says it does not print information on the surveillance of autocratic governments or terrorist groups, only on allied democracies and their citizens.
Time now for Listening Post News Bites. In China, journalists have begun government-run training courses on how to report the news, and they'd better pay attention in class because their jobs could depend on it. According to the Japanese-based Kyoto News Agency, around 250,000 journalists, from cub reporters all the way up to senior editors, have been ordered to attend the classes to learn how to best offer a party-friendly slant on foreign policy and other newsworthy issues. Kyoto reported that journalists in the classes were urged to push a pro-Chinese line on territorial disputes with Japan, the Philippines and Vietnam. The journalists have around three months to bring their reporting into line before facing an examination in the new year and failing the test could mean losing their accreditation. While professional reporters are being coached, hundreds of microbloggers on China's own Twitter-like Sina Weibo social network have been arrested since August. It's a clampdown on those the government refers to as rumor mongers. Online critics of the government in Beijing face up to three years in jail if posts deemed to be false are visited by more than 5,000 internet users or are reposted more than 500 times. Savvy news consumers in India have noted a change of tack at one of the country's oldest and most respected national newspapers. This is a story that involves family differences, politics and power. On October 21st, Kasturi and Sons, the company that publishes The Hindu, took the editor's job away from Siddharth Bharadaraja and demoted him to a contributor columnist. Jumping onto Twitter before he was pushed, Bharadaraja tweeted with The Hindu's owners deciding to revert to being a family-run and edited newspaper, I am resigning from The Hindu with immediate effect. When he was appointed in 2011, Virata Rajan, an Indian-American, became the first editor of The Hindu in nearly five decades not to have been a member of the Kasturi family. At the time, the move was described as a welcome, progressive step towards a separation of ownership and editorial, and it prompted three family members to resign. Virata Rajan's departure now suggests that the paper is going back to its old ways. In an interview with another newspaper, the Indian Express, the chairman of The Hindu's publishing arm, N. Ram said the changes at the top were brought about by, quote, editorialization in the guise of news and loaded items on politicians. He failed, however, to provide specifics on that. A fake Twitter account that had journalists in Washington guessing for months about who was behind it has been revealed to be that of a White House insider, and his tweets have cost him his job. When the at NatSec Wonk account disappeared from Twitter earlier this week, reporters and staffers who had grown used to reading the pointed criticism and commentary began asking some questions. Who was the mystery tweeter who had described himself as a keen observer of the foreign policy and national security scene, and who unapologetically says what everyone else only thinks? On October 22nd, Josh Rogan, a reporter with the Daily Beast website, reported that Jofi Joseph, a senior member of a State Department team working on nuclear negotiations, was the man behind the account and that he had been fired. Later that same day, the White House confirmed the report. Journalists had also been exposed to the NatSec wonk treatment, including Margaret Sullivan of the New York Times and that Daily Beast reporter Josh Rogan. In fact, back on September 26th, Joseph tweeted, just a hunch, but I have the sense lots of people would like to punch Josh Rogan in the face. But he who tweets last, tweets best. Rogan broke the story and Joseph lost his job. The late American writer Susan Sontag once said that to photograph is to frame, and to frame is to exclude. She was saying that as a medium, photography is and always has been subjective. However, in the digital era, there is a new and growing subjectivity in photojournalism, one you've most likely seen, but not necessarily noticed. It's called post-processing. It's when photographers digitally enhance their work to make it more captivating to the eye. The practice has raised some ethical questions, and embodying the debate is the winner of the 2013 World Press Photo Award. It shows a burial procession in Gaza last year, and it was digitally enhanced to the point that the photographer was accused of submitting an image that was, in fact, a composite. That clearly wasn't an issue for the judges, which tells you how much the industry has changed. But the question does linger when it comes to digital enhancement. Where should photojournalists and news organizations draw the line? The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on this year's World Press Photo Awards and the growing use of post-processing in photojournalism. The World Press Photo's annual contest is considered the world's biggest and most prestigious competition in press photography. The aim, as the exhibition travels the globe, is to get people talking about the stories, the images and photojournalism. This year's winning entry did all that. 
Some people called the photo a fake. It was taken by Swedish photographer Paul Hansen in Gaza and showed a funeral procession for members of a Palestinian family killed in an Israeli airstrike. There was something about the composition and lighting that seemed surreal. But what Hansen did was to keep superimposing the same image on itself until he achieved the desired effect. He essentially overlaid the same picture multiple times to reveal the most detail out of both the dark and light areas, simulating the way humans can see. That's what he tried to do, and that's interesting, quite experimental, almost pioneering. The fact is that for the past 50 years we've been used to seeing photos that are a product of that chemical process, and anything that strays from that scares us. The strength of this image is in putting together the many elements which recall the tragedy of the Palestinians, the grief of the families. All this connects strongly with the viewer's emotion and empathy. But I think that the post-production is bothersome. The purpose of the photographer should be to bring the viewer in, but in this case, he's distanced. There we get into the area of taste. How much of um, uh, this enhancement do you do you accept how much do you as an uh, does your editorial policy allow for and for some he's crossed the line for others he hasn't but it's i would say almost impossible to draw an absolute line that ca can or can't be crossed and that is an ongoing discussion at the center of the discussion over post-processing the art of digitally retouching images are photo labs like 10b photography in rome this digital darkroom, as they've come to be known, does the kind of enhancing used by Paul Hansen. Founders Francesco Zazola and Claudio Palmasano say that what they do is editorial photography. They say their work remains within the realm of photojournalism because they do enhance color, but they don't add or remove pixels from the images. La fotografia, photography, uh, both digital and analog, creates a matrix. In the analog era, these were called negatives. In the digital era, they're called RAW files. We use complex, modern, advanced instruments which can radically change an image. We use them in a journalistic context and know their limitation. We voluntarily apply limitations to the tools offered by these technologies because journalism can only be different from simple photography through a set of ethical values. Our method is such that we have to think about how every picture is and could be. We don't fall for the way the digital negative is automatically produced. Every time we start from scratch, that's our strength. We don't consider the starting point as more real than any other point of view. The starting point is just an automatic process by Canon or Nikon or whatever the camera brand. That's what makes us different. But it's still volatile territory because even subtle modifications to a photograph can change our interpretation of it. For example, in 1994, during the trial of American footballer O.J. Simpson, who was accused of murdering his wife, two leading U.S. publications, Newsweek and Time magazine, ran the same mugshot of the athlete on their front covers. However, by tweaking the color and the contrast of the image, the publications led their readers down two very different editorial lines. The idea of crime in the U.S. is often tied to African-American communities. So by darkening his skin, they highlighted this element. His belonging to that racial group. There are ethical values set by common sense, and an application of these digital tools should be subservient to ethics and the will not to mislead or simply reinforce established stereotypes. Keep colors as close to their original state as possible. The ethical lines seem straightforward, but when you consider that one of the most flagrant manipulations of color is to shoot in black and white, and yet we don't question the integrity of monochromatic images, the issue becomes complicated. So then the line becomes, don't manipulate the pixels, don't add or remove objects or colors. But even that line can be blurred. After the Boston bombings, uh, some newspapers ran images of that event, and the newspaper didn't want to offend anyone, so they removed severed limbs from the photographs. Now, I would say that either run the photo as it was or don't run the photo. I think once you get into a situation where you're pulling stuff out of an image, it's a bit worrying. 
because once again it's supposed to be photojournalism it's supposed to be journalistic we've had episodes in war photos where explosions have been doubled up the smoke was extended the sky darkened to make everything even more shocking and grand this attitude is in conflict with the authenticity of the photo reporter who already takes enormous risks to be in that place and shouldn't be made to seek extra enhancements for the testimony of a situation our demand for visual perfection can be traced back to fashion photography with a nip and a tuck here and an airbrush there. But photo manipulation has a long, dubious history, be it Stalin's censors removing an out-of-favor Soviet politician after his execution, or a state-owned Egyptian newspaper giving Hosni Mubarak a place of undue prominence at diplomatic talks, or Iran trying to make a missile test look more successful than it actually was. These days, though, Photography has become a much more crowded and competitive place. Camera phones, citizen journalists, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we are constantly bombarded with images. Photojournalists are struggling to stand out and are pushing the limits. Ultimately, we have to remain cognizant that when looking at a picture, be it in fashion or the news, that the medium is easily manipulated. Photojournalism is about truthfulness and you're seeing extremely bright colors Ultimately, there's a big risk of undermining your message and that's a fine line that the photojournalistic community has to find between attracting attention and stepping over that line and undermining your, your integrity. Photography is not reality, it's a subjective medium. And for now, how it is used will always depend on who is using it and the tools, the growing number of tools at their disposal. More Global Village Voices now on when enhancement becomes manipulation of the news. In the modern age of digital photography, the processing aspect has become a much larger component of an image's DNA than it ever has before. In the past, most manipulation or retouching came from Photoshop. Now photographers have greatly been able to expand the capabilities as to what they're able to do to an image in the develop process. More and more images every year are becoming this mixture of photojournalism and fine art. With regards to Paul Henson's image, I feel that it is acceptable photojournalism in so much as that he has photographically kept the intrinsic facts of the image and applied no more post-processing than any other image we might see in the media today. Finally, the powers that be like to say that government surveillance is imperative when it comes to matters of national security. But as the Edward Snowden NSA story proves, exactly what constitutes a threat to national security is a pretty gray area. While searching online for an NSA surveillance video, we came across a little something produced by the American Civil Liberties Union back in 2004 in which they imagined what government surveillance might look like in the future. It isn't about international terror alerts or hijack plots, it's about ordering pizza. This web video is not much to look at visually, but what the ACLU foresaw, and this was almost 10 years ago, is a world in which all manner of personal electronic interaction is merged into one giant database, where our personal habits, weaknesses, and failings can be monitored in a big brother kind of way. Can you imagine a world like that? Ordering pizza in the future is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. The total is $67, Stephen. Sixty-seven dollars? Hmm. You could say forty-eight dollars if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the sixty-seven dollars, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the Sprout Subs. Good choice, sir. That's how much? Oh, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? 